All right, good evening, everyone, and welcome once again to the FAFB's COVID-19 webinar series designed to assist Florida's family physicians and their staff in dealing with the ongoing coronavirus pandemic. I'm Jay Nelson, FAFB's Executive Vice President. And once again, it's my pleasure to moderate tonight's presentation, Telemedicine 2.0, Lessons Learned in Practice, which you know actually brings us back to our roots. It was our very first webinar addressed uh, this topic about five weeks ago when many family physicians were embarking upon virtual visits for the most part for the very first time. Not surprisingly, that webinar hosted 225 live attendees and nearly 750 on-demand views since. So here's the question. What do you do when you have that much success? Even I can figure this one out. Here's what you do. You have your expert, bring in some more experts. You organize a panel, and as all good executives should do, I'm going to get out of the way. But before I do that, please remember, all participants are in listen-only mode. If you have a question, simply type it into the chat box and our presenters will attempt to answer it throughout the program or during the question and answer period at the end. So now as promised, what am I going to do? I'm getting out of the way. Here's our first expert, Dr. Julia Jenkins. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you, Jay. You do that so well. <laughs> so if you can go to the next slide. Absolutely. I wanted to um, just first introduce um, the physicians that very graciously are contributing to this webinar. Um, again, we have Dr. Julie Braddy Roberts, who uh, is a friend and colleague. We both work for Bay Care Health Care System in the Tampa Bay area. She is one of their physician informaticists and is actually Bay Care Medical Group's telehealth physician lead. So she really brings a lot of expertise to this webinar series. Um, again, I'm Dr. Julia Jenkins. I'm one of the faculty physicians at USF's Family Medicine Residency in Clearwater. Um, I help to teach our telemedicine curriculum here at the residency, and I also assist Baycare Medical Group in their telehealth efforts on the steering committee. We're very fortunate to have join us for the second webinar, Dr. Nipa Shah, who's faculty, she's actually the chair of the Family Medicine Department at the University of Florida College of Medicine in Jacksonville, and she's the chair of their telehealth task force at UF's College of Medicine. And then finally, although he's not speaking on the webinar, I definitely have to recognize Dr. Chris Scuderi, who has been instrumental in organizing these webinars and um, providing content for the FAFP website to help all of the family doctors in Florida deal with this pandemic, and he is our official FAFP COVID-19 director. Uh, next slide. So what we're going to do is um, add to the first webinar, and so we're not going to go over any of the same material, but there really has been a tremendous amount of billing changes and regulatory changes. Um, a lot of you asked us to kind of expand more on how to do a good um, physical exam remotely, so we're going to kind of touch on that more. I'm going to give a few academic updates for those of you in academic medicine. We're going to talk about patient privacy concerns as it relates to telemedicine and some of the consent that you'll want to document, and then uh, briefly going to talk about telehealth equity, but that's really just the first part of the webinar. Um, the remaining part of the webinar is going to be hosted by our other two experts because they're going to tackle some of the common questions that we've got, kind of looking at our telemedicine 2.0 and, and really um, adding some finesse and some um, details to questions that you guys have asked us. Next slide. So I think for all of us in family medicine, this has been an exciting adventure having to jump headfirst into telemedicine. I think family physicians are very well suited for telemedicine because I think all of us are very adaptable and we can connect with patients um, and overcome a lot of barriers in trying to connect with our patients. And so I've seen family physicians throughout the state just do an amazing job embracing telehealth over the past month. And it's just been a rewarding time, too, because I think patients have a, 
a newfound appreciation for their family physicians and their first responders. And so although this has been very challenging, I think for a lot of us, it's also been very fulfilling and rewarding. So I just wanted to touch on that. Next slide. So just to kind of um, talk a little bit about the prior webinar is telemedicine can encompass a bunch of different types of visits. And Medicare, CMS, and, and commercial payers um, are allowing us to do different types of visits. I thought this was a very nice algorithm um, on trying to decide what type of telehealth visit you might consider for your patients. And so I think for most of us, if we're capable, we would ideally like to do a video visit. So you can see the patient, you can talk to the patient in real time. If you're not able to do a video visit, then you can kind of look at some of these other visits. So you could do a phone visit and that can be billable for a lot of payers. You could do this thing called a virtual check-in where really you're just either calling the patient or touching base um, through the portal and trying to determine if you can manage something um, remotely that way or if they need to come in. Or you can do this thing called an e-visit where you're really um, addressing an issue via the portal or some kind of electronic communication and you can bill for that. So it's, uh, there really is a lot of options, but for more details and some of the caveats on using those, um, please refer back to the prior webinar. Next slide. So this um, definitely is a change um, from what I said before. So the video telemedicine, you know, we used to um, say that we were just going to bill the number of visit uh, minutes that we spent on the actual visit. But now CMS and the other payers have clarified that it's not the, just the minutes spent during the visit. You actually are gonna include your face-to-face, -face, but also your non-face-to-face -face minutes, any minutes that the physician spends doing medical decision-making. So if you do a chart review prior to the visit, then the visit, then you're doing orders and your documentation after the visit, that should all be included in the minutes that you're documenting. So I put some charts there that um, <clears throat> include what they're calling this MPM time or medical decision-making time. You can see that that's different than the prior times that we were using for in-person visits when we were using time to bill in-person visits. You can still bill based on complexity. So this is kind of an either or. So if you're doing a level four and your complexity has met the level four, then you don't necessarily need to meet the minute requirement. And the other thing that I wanted to clarify with documenting based on time is that we used to have to document that greater than 50% of the visit was spent on patient counseling, but during the pandemic, that is not a requirement. And they also waived the requirements for history and physical exam requirements, just to try and make this easier. Um, also kind of interestingly, if you're using some kind of video software or audio software um, in your office so that you can communicate with patients if they're in the waiting room or their car or a different room and you didn't wanna necessarily have them um, cl in close proximity to you, you would not bill that as a telemedicine visit. So if the patient is in the same facility, but you're using this software, um, the, the payers are considering that to be still an in-person visit and you would bill it as an in-person visit. Next slide. So the other changes from the prior webinar is Medicare was asking us to use place of service to they have changed that. And so for your video telemedicine visits, you wanna use place of service 11. And that's the same place of service code that we use for our inpatient visits. This is really important because um, a lot of times with that place of service too, the payers were reimbursing at, what, at what's called the facility price. So for most of us that do not work in hospital-owned facilities, 
um, were typically reimbursed at the non-facility price. And I highlighted the difference between the level three and the level four facility or non-facility price because if you document place of service 11 for your telemedicine visit, you'll get the non-facility rate. And that's a much higher rate than if you're using the place of service too. So you wanna be very careful. And we're gonna to touch on that in a later slide. You also wanna make sure that you're still using modifier 95. So now if you're seeing a telemedicine visit that's a level three, and you're using the 99213, and you're using the same place of service 11 as you would an in-person visit, the only way the payer is gonna know that that was telemedicine is if you add the modifier 95. And although it's not related to telemedicine, but it is related to the pandemic, I just wanted to mention modifier CR because that's also been a change that if you're managing a patient that has COVID-19 or may have COVID-19, you can add that modifier to um, waive any cost sharing for that patient. Next slide. So this looks very busy, but this was a lot of material that was covered in the last webinar, but um, the changes to Medicare. So Medicare does cover um, kind of your routine visits and your wellness visits. They cover transitional visits, um, a lot of their screening and advanced care planning codes and, and these other types of telehealth visits. But what they've added to that is they also um, now cover for telemedicine inpatient visits. There's no um, time restriction on that. So they used to have it where you could only bill a telemedicine every third day. Now you can do it daily and there's no restriction. They're covering um, seeing patients at ALS facilities. They're covering home visits, neonatal and pediatric critical care. And the other big change um, is that they are now reimbursing for phone calls. And that is not, um, the same reimbursement as your 99213, 99214 video um, office visits. So I put the facility rate reimbursement there, but um, there is some reimbursement with that. It's really important that you document the amount of minutes spent on the call when you're billing for that. The other thing is um, that for phone calls and then also for virtual check-ins, e-visits and, and remote patient monitoring, um, Medicare and the other payers do not consider those to be telemedicine visits. And so you would not use the 95 modifier, but you would use the associated CPT codes. Also for commercial billing, um, I, I have not seen any payer reimbursing or covering for pediatric or adult um, physicals, health maintenance physicals, um, they are covering for routine office visits. Um, some of them are covering for phone calls, virtual check-ins, e-visits, um, and we're gonna talk a little bit more about that. Next slide. So this chart was um, presented initially over a month ago at the first webinar, and then it's been updated many, many times. This is the most current version as of two days ago. You can see um, that most of the commercial payers that I have listed here are in fact covering for telemedicine visits. And, and what's very interesting and, and has kind of been a new development is that several payers will also allow you to bill a telemedicine um, with the CPT codes that we would use for in-office visits with audio only and with no video. There is very specific language here though, and you, so you'd have to be really, really careful if you were gonna build telemedicine and not have video, um, because it is only a few payers that are doing this, and some of them have stipulations. Like for example, Aetna will um, let you uh, bill for a telemedicine with audio only, but only if video is not available, and only if it is a minor acute issue. So you couldn't do any chronic care this way or any significant medical issues this way. And then also listed there is some of the other um, services that the payers will reimburse for. 
Unfortunately, the other thing that's kind of confusing is there are a few commercial payers that are requesting the place of service two instead of the place of service 11. So, you know, unfortunately, you're going to have to check with each payer. And I would imagine, although I um, don't know for certain, but I would imagine that place of service two has lower reimbursement than the other. Next slide. Uh, there's been some updates to Florida Medicaid as well, and so telemedicine video visits are definitely covered by Florida Medicaid. Um, they are paid at parity, so similar to a face-to-face -face visit. Um, Medicaid does require video if you're going to bill for telemedicine, and they're now saying you can see your patients that are at assisted living facilities via telemedicine. They are continuing to cover phone calls and other services, and, and that has not changed. Next slide. So um, before I kind of jump into this slide, I just wanted to share why we included this. We, we had a physician that was practicing in Jacksonville and practiced very close to the Florida-Georgia line. And her question was, you know, a lot of my patients are in Georgia and come across the border to see me in Florida. Can I see them via telemedicine? So for the pandemic, CMS has temporarily waived requirements um, for out-of-state physicians, practitioners to be licensed in the state that they're seeing patients. And so it is okay for that physician to do telemedicine for their patients in Georgia. There are a couple of conditions. And so the physician has to be enrolled in Medicare. Um, they have to have a valid license to practice in the state where they enrolled in Medicare, so Florida in our case, they also have to be providing services to patients where in their state where the emergency is occurring. So it's saying that make sure that you're providing care to patients in Florida if you're also going to be providing care in Georgia. And you, of course, can't be excluded from practicing in the state um, where you're licensed. Next slide. So I just wanted to touch on um, some tips for doing remote physical exam and just some things that have been really helpful. And so, you know, one, I think eye contact is really important. And this is something that um, you, you have to practice doing and just kind of remind yourself to make sure you're looking at wherever your camera is. I, I know when we first started doing telemedicine, we put a little rubber ducky on, on top of the camera just to kind of draw our eye to the camera, but it is really important for making your patients feel comfortable. When you're doing your telemedicine visit, you don't want to be backlit, and so you don't want like bright windows or bright lights behind you, so you ideally want light kind of shining towards your face. Um, having harsh fluorescent lights above can also be um, kind of make it difficult for the patient to see you. Another really helpful tip for your patient to do, and, and this happens all the time when I'm doing telemedicine, is it's very difficult to see them and to really appreciate subtle findings if they're holding a phone in their hand. So you'll get a lot of motion artifacts if they're holding their camera or their phone. So you wanna encourage the patient to prop their phone up or stabilize their camera somehow, and that's gonna help you get better picture quality. It also is very helpful because we're just used to doing exams. We're not used to teaching exams, but if you can show your patient what exam maneuver you're trying to get them to do, um, that can be very helpful. And I think um, it really goes a long way to reassure your patients and say, you know, as again, as a clinician, that I'm, I'm trained to be able to tell a lot about your health via video and seeing your color and how you respond to me. Um, and when they're doing exam maneuvers, just reassuring them that they're doing a great job and that that's exactly what you wanted them to do so that they feel comfortable. I, I wanted to remind everyone, or if you hadn't heard the prior webinar, that American Well very graciously allowed um, the SAFP and our Florida family physicians to access their um, remote physical exam training for, that they provide to their physicians. Um, they're providing that for free, 
So at the bottom of the slide is the link for that training. It's excellent videos on how to do a bunch of different exams. Um, but I specifically wanted to give a few tips um, when you're kind of evaluating a patient with upper respiratory symptoms. And so don't forget that your patients, a lot of times they'll have access to a thermometer, um, to a blood pressure cuff. You can teach them how to do their pulse. Um, they may have a peak flow meter. They might have a pulse ox at home. So really trying to capture those vitals. Even better is if you can have your staff call ahead of time and either capture that data ahead of time or just have your staff remind the patient to check their blood pressure or to check those vitals before they get on the call. And that's gonna make it more efficient. I found it's really helpful to have patients press on their maxillary sinuses or their frontal sinuses and try to identify where they have the most tenderness. It's also really helpful to have them get really close to the camera and then have them breathe out of one nostril while they're occluding the other nostril and then kind of switch to the other side and assess if they have nasal congestion or if they have any obstruction that you can hear. It's very difficult to assess the respiratory rate, but sometimes that can be helpful if your patient is very tachypnic or if they're struggling to breathe. Make sure that you coach them to kind of get the camera in a position that you can watch their chest rise and kind of um, visualize their breathing. You'll also be very surprised um, to see uh, how much you can see when you have your patient just open their mouth really close to the camera. And in the video, it talks about having them kind of kiss the camera, um, but open their mouth really wide. And you can see their oropharynx really nicely. Their tonsils, you can have them tap on their teeth. You, you know, you can have them look under their tongue um, and do a bunch of different things that way. Also, I, the looking for lymph nodes is easy for your patient to do. You coach them to use their first and second digits, the pads of their first and second digits, um, and gently kind of do circles or just kind of press under their jaw or around their neck. And they would describe if they feel something hard like a marble or if it feels kind of rubbery like a grape. Is it bigger than a grape? Is it smaller than a grape? Um, trying to use analogies to help them describe it. And then finally, have them breathe if, if, you're, if they have asthma or you're concerned about bronchospasm or you just kind of want to further assess their breathing. Remind them to breathe in and out through their mouth and not their nose if you're really trying to hear the air movement. And it helps, too, to maybe have them quickly exhale so that may trigger bronchospasm or coughing, and that, that'll definitely tell you some information. Next slide. So um, the British Medical Journal recently published an article um, on COVID-19, a remote assessment in primary care. Really excellent article, so I would encourage um, most of you to look at that. But just some of the highlights is they touched on how can you assess for respiration and trying to determine if, if these patients with COVID need to come in or if they need to go to the emergency department. And so one, um, just really asking more details about um, the history of their breathing problems. Is it at rest as well as with exertion? Are they having difficulty in speaking or saying a few words or has it impaired their usual activities? Like, are they not able to walk their dog? Are they not able to prepare meals? And so that'll tell you how severe it is. Obviously, you can also just listen to them talk. And if they seem like they're having a difficult time um, speaking or if they're having to catch their breath every few words, that'll, that'll help you gauge severity. And then really focusing on how much change they've had since their initial presentation. And so if it is somebody with COPD and they always have shortness of breath, is this significantly different than their baseline? Or um, is this similar? And that, that's going to help you um, figure this out. And then this is also where it's very helpful to have good lighting and to make sure you're getting good video quality because you can look for things like flared nostrils or cyanosis. If your patient just appears clammy or sweaty or pale, 
um, if they are in a position with their body where they look like they're trying to use accessory muscles, like in this tripod posture that you can see to the left, um, and then also just um, if they're coughing or wheezing or something, you can hear uh, via audio. Next slide. So um, I, I just wanted to take a moment because if there are any resident physicians listening to this, um, I wanted to say that I know that this pandemic has uniquely impacted your, your professional, personal lives and your education. I, I'm gonna speak for all the attendings that, that we truly admire the strength and dedication that we've, we've all seen you have in the hospital, in the ER, in taking care of our sick patients. And, and I really just wanted to sincerely thank all of you for your courage. Um, to, to add to our prior webinar, um, faculty, again, can provide supervision for visits um, through telecommunication technology. And so you don't actually have to be in the room with your resident or your fellow for them to be able to build telemedicine. And that includes if it's visits that would typically have required um, the faculty to be present with the resident. So they do have to be available via live um, texting or video or a telephone call. And if your resident is billing um, a visit that would typically not be graduate exempt, um, they would still use the GC modifier even if you did not go into the room. Um, the other change from the prior webinar is that um, during the time of the pandemic, residents can also bill telemedicine visits now based on time. So they can either use complexity or time for their billing, where that was not true in the past. And if you're looking for good academic resources for teaching telehealth and telemedicine in your academic facility, there's a link there from STFM, and it has really fantastic resources for, for um, learning a lot more about telemedicine and how to teach it to your residents. Next slide. So um, I, I wanted to make sure that we talked about patient privacy and consent because a couple of um, physicians have talked about, you know, there's, they've been in some kind of awkward situations with residents where a resident is mentioning, uh, I'm sorry, with patients, I apologize where your patient has um, concerns about an STD or, or has maybe um, a genital rash. And there's been questions about how do you handle that? How do we address privacy? So one, it is really important with each and every telemedicine visit that we ask our patients, is there anyone in the room that you would not want to hear your medical information? Because we don't have the benefit of being able to see everybody in the room and making sure they're in a private location. If you're doing a remote physical exam, it's very similar to doing an in-person in physical exam. So if you feel like it's a sensitive exam and it's a, a patient of another gender or a situation where you feel like you need a chaperone, you should get a chaperone. So have one of your staff members um, be with you when you're doing the remote visit and then document that you had a chaperone present when you were doing the telemedicine visit. And although there has been a lot of, um, you know, guidelines about HIPAA that have been relaxed during the pandemic, I, I think the obvious thing here is that if you're going to be addressing sensitive things with the patient, don't use FaceTime. You know, really try to use software that has HIPAA, HIPAA agreements so these are just a few examples of telemedicine software that um, is HIPAA compliant. And then the rest of the slide um, has some examples of how you could document in your notes to make sure that you're documenting that you address potential privacy and security issues related to telehealth, um, and also some documentation for why you're doing telemedicine in the first place. So it's really important to show your payer why you chose to do a telemedicine visit. So for example, you can just say that you chose to do telemedicine because of risk of exposure to the SARS-2 coronavirus. Um, and that gives them an idea why you didn't bring them into the office. Next slide. So um, this is the last slide I'm gonna go over and then we're gonna kind of switch gears. But 
I wanted to go over um, some of the new um, funding that's become available to help with telehealth. And so, you know, unfortunately, some of our patients um, don't have good access to this. And working in an academic setting, we, setting, we see a lot of Medicaid, we see a lot of um, financially impoverished patients, and um, out of the CARES Act, um, the funding that's being um, allocated to help with the pandemic, there's this um, Federal Communications Commission COVID-19 telehealth program. So you can apply for this. Um, it's for nonprofit and public eligible healthcare providers, and it's it's to help those patients that otherwise would have difficulty with access. So it can pay for telehealth equipment, remote patient monitoring, um, pay for broadband connect connections, and, and just kind of helping our patients have access to this. There's another separate program um, also coming out of this funding called the Connected Care Pilot Program that is specifically geared toward low income and veteran patients. And I know that Dr. Roberts is gonna to touch on this more, so I'll stop there. But the other kind of fun project that's unique to the state of Florida is this thing called Project Vital. And so two tablets are gonna be allocated to about 150 nursing homes and care communities all across the state. And that's not necessarily telemedicine, but it's to help our elderly patients have um, meaningful connections with their family um, and with healthcare providers so that they don't feel so isolated. Next slide. So now for the second half of our webinar, we're gonna basically tackle one or two questions at a time, and then we're gonna let um, our other webinar telemedicine experts um, expand and answer those questions for us. And so the first two questions are, how do you deliver telehealth care to patients with health care disparities? And how do you best offer telemedicine to technologically challenged patients? Next slide. Okay, everyone, thank you so much. That was excellent. You gave us so many good tips. Um, so to answer these questions, how do you deliver telehealth care with health disparities? Um, you have to understand our patient population here in Jacksonville, Florida. We work at an essential hospital-based system, and uh, we have patients who are underserved from a variety of communities, and we have three clinics that take care of those without insurance as well. And believe it or not, the, the one clinic that was our champion that started giving uh, appointments to uh, provide telehealth virtually almost a year and a half ago was one of our most underserved patient clinics. And it what, it, what was most important was that there was the medical director of the clinic who was just committed to teaching their clinic and the patient population that they serve um, about technology and using this to help them. And over the last year and a half, uh, they have beat all, all barriers that you can imagine. So they're really, with persistence, with training, with a vision and with commitment, um, disparities can be overcome. Um, and so some of the tricks that I'm sharing with you came from them. So when we think about um, Wi-Fi access, right? Because that's something that the patients need. Uh, the creative ways in which this community um, has come together is that patients who need a virtual appointment sometimes use a neighbor's Wi-Fi network, or they will go to a local store or the library uh, in the parking lot and um, access their Wi-Fi network. So they have come up with creative ways to um, you know, access uh, care from their physicians without having to go all the way into the clinics. Um, using their relatives or their friends' phones, that was another um, idea that uh, patients actually came up with. So even if they didn't possess their own phone, they knew someone who did who let them borrow it. Uh, and then telephone visits work with health disparities patients, um, especially the elderly and you know, at least for now, we are able to collect some revenue with telephone visits. But uh, if if that can get the job done and um, take care of the patient's needs, um, that can certainly be utilized as well. 
Finally, another uh, idea that we have implemented here in Jacksonville is we received a grant from the CDC to help patients living with HIV access care to telemedicine. And what we did was we partnered with community-based organizations, um, the Northeast Florida AIDS Network, um, certain homeless shelters, some LGBTQ, um, you know, uh, community-based organizations, and we actually um, donated some uh, technology equipment to them, and then we set up virtual visit stations. We did some training with our CBOs, and um, if patients were to visit that particular homeless shelter or that particular CBO, they could use that uh, setup of a virtual visit to access care. So um, that was another way that we managed health disparities. Next slide, please. And then the question of uh, technological challenge patients. Uh, that includes many, many patients. And um, it is surprising the kinds of issues that uh, you deal with. Uh, everything from how, what is a pop-up blocker? Why can't I access that? How do I turn off my pop-up blockers? Um, the latest uh, ver you know, version of um, iOS wasn't uploaded, so then it wouldn't work. That app wasn't updated, so let's go over how to update apps. You know, so, so you think that folks are uh, able to just download an app and just start the visit with you. It's uh, it's interesting what what folks um, have trouble with. So what we've done is we you know just like in uh, our patient care, we have this mantra that when you make a handout, it has to be at a fifth grade level, a reading level. You know we at, for te for telehealth teaching, virtual visits teaching, we have said we just need screenshots, you know, one after the other, and uh, no no words, <laughs> just pictures of what your phone would look like. So, for example, here's one um, where we are trying to teach patients how to um, actually teach physicians how to um, uh, set up their Epic Haiku patient portal. We have our Epic, uh, our EMR is Epic over here. But if you look at the bottom of the screenshot, you know, it says place calls using Deximity. So it, literally it's step-by-step -step instructions and using uh, a lot of pictures um, to help folks uh, understand technology. Next slide. Hi. Um... I'm Dr. Roberts, and I was going to talk about some of the same things that Dr. Shaw had just spoken about. Um, I'm actually practicing with BayCare over in the Tampa Bay area, and we've also done some of the very similar ways to deliver health care to people that are having different disparities. As far as increasing access to the primary care as well as specialty care via telehealth, I feel that telehealth actually has the potential to be a great equalizer for the health care for people who have economic disparities. It can lead to more timely access. It can add to a lower cost environment. We've actually shown across our system and we've seen studies across multiple other systems that it decreases ER usage. And we can actually get behavioral health, oral health, specialty clinics to be available to people who otherwise would not have availability in more rural areas, or sometimes even more urban areas that don't have the draw for those types of specialists. We can also overcome workforce and access barriers. A lot of the underserved populations have the providers within their own communities, such as primary care, but that they cannot get to them. They can't travel long distances, they don't have money for gas. They don't have a car of their own. To actually get there, it might involve having the mother, the father, whoever, not work that day. And not working that day might mean they don't pay rent that month. So reducing the burden of lost work, transportation, childcare can be the goal of telemedicine. Next slide. So how do we get the telemedicine to the people who may not have a phone, who may not have 4G or Wi-Fi internet service? That is always the great question. 
um, we do know that many rural areas may not even have access to fast internet connections. Um, Dr. Jenkins had talked about multiple grants. There's actually another grant out there called the Federal Communications Commission's Rural Health Care Program. They've actually been given $400 million annually to provide funding to rural communities and rural health care providers. All you have to do is apply. And I put a um, link to that if anybody is interested in looking into that amount of money. And if you're accepted, you can get broadband networks into your community. You can also get other funding for other things that you need to provide telehealth to your rural communities. Next slide. Um, I also wanted to mention that, as Dr. Shaw said, you need to be able to work with the technologically challenged patients. Detailed instructions are key. If you don't have educated staff, you're not going to be able to have educated patients. So what we've tried to train at BayCare are essentially super users. Um, we started with a pilot for telemedicine. We did not realize COVID-19 was coming. So we went from essentially having my office and Dr. Jenkins' office providing telemedicine to our established patients to bringing up around 900 physicians within about a two week period of time, all providing telemedicine to our established patients. You can imagine that's a huge haul. How do we get 900 physicians times that times five, six staff per physician, all trained, all at once, and then get all of the patients trained as well. Huge effort, huge work effort. And to do that, we needed, like she said, screenshots, we needed bulletins, we needed everything we could think of to educate people how to use our platform. Our platform is Amwell, but it could be any platform. If you're using Zoom, if you're using Doxy me, it does not matter. You need to know your platform. You need to train your staff to know your platform, how to download it on the patient's phone, how to download it on your phone, what it looks like front, back. That way when they call and they're confused, you can say, oh yes, you're caught up on that step. Let me tell you which button to push. You don't have to see it, you just know exactly where they're hung up so you can tell them where the next step is to help them fix the problem. Um, we have brochures for the patient. We have different um, sites they can go to on the internet, on their portal. Pretty much anywhere that they can go, they can look and find more information. We wanted to make sure that our most needy patients got white glove treatment. And I say our most needy, more like our elderly individuals, our people that we thought would have the most problems setting up the platform on their phones, on their devices. And when I say white glove, we actually trained our staff to do face-to-face -face and pretty much take the phone in their hand, download the app, and get everything set up for that patient. And one thing to remember is most tech-challenged patients have tech-savvy friends. So if you're on the phone with the individual the day before and you realize there is no way they're ever going to figure this out, say, hey, can you have your daughter come over, your friend come over, somebody come over and help you go through these steps so that way you're ready to talk to Doc tomorrow. And most people do have somebody that the staff can help walk through that can get them ready for that visit. Next slide. So the next two questions are, how do I address decreased staff productivity and lower office revenue? And the second question, which a lot of you have asked, what is the best way for me to schedule my office visits, both remote and in-person visits, if I'm doing a mixture of both? Next slide. Dr. Shaw. Yep, I'm here. So how do I address um, the issues with um, lower office revenue, decreased uh, productivity? So a few things that we have done, and again, there is no good answer to this. And I know lots of organizations are, are doing this in different ways. 
um, our organization has tried to convert some uh, exempt employees in the hospital especially to non-exempt hourly so that their time can be monitored and they're only paid for the time that they're actually working. Um, leave without pay and um, other leave that you know, may have been used later in the fiscal year uh, could be used now so that, it, again, it doesn't bring in um, immediate cash flow, but down the line, it could help with, uh, you know, less expense later on. And then uh, we, you know, decreased productivity is certainly um, something that has affected everyone's bottom line. And recruiting our staff to help recruit patients is really important. You know, the, whoever is the front line, whether you have a call center, it's your front desk staff, or your medical assistants following up on your patients, you know, the calm, reassuring manner in which they're spoken to, um, you know, if they can go into grocery stores, they can come into your clean clinics. And um, that's going to be a culture change that I think will have to happen before uh, we see increased productivity within the clinical setting. Masks in our community is another a measure that uh, you know may help patients feel more comfortable. We do have some masks that we can give to patients as they enter, but you know we anticipate running out of those eventually. So if patients can be taught to at least uh, bring in their own mask or just general safety measures, um, that would be a helpful thing. There are some federal funds. The CARES Act have um, delineated some funds for not just hospitals, but um, physicians who have a certain Medicare population and also those who serve um, uninsured or underserved uh, uh, populations. So the CARES Act um, is a resource for you to investigate to see if you're eligible to receive some of those funds. And then, of course, there are small business loans for those who are in private practice and uh, are in a small business setting that, that you could receive as well. One caveat, um, the federal funds come with uh, a payback timeline. <laughs> uh, it's not a gift, it's a loan. And for the most part, you know, uh, I believe it's before November that all of it has to be paid back. Um, so just something else to think about. Next slide. So scheduling remote and in-person uh, visits, it's, this is tricky. You, you want your day to go smoothly, and you also want to keep your patients safe through a variety of, of manners. So one idea is that well visits are in the mornings, and then the afternoons, they're the sick visits, so that uh, after the afternoon is over, thorough clinic, cleaning can be done, and that minimizes exposure for the following day. We tried that and um, it worked well for a little while, but then what happened was when patients called, they had to be seen at some point and the schedule was just accommodated and um, not every visit was nicely tucked away in the morning for well or afternoon for sick. That was actually very, uh, it was a good idea, but it was very difficult to do. What we're starting now that the telehealth visits um, have increased is having blocks of our time um, just for telehealth visits. Um, that has worked well. That allows for more smooth transition between one patient to the other. Um, and, you know, if you, again, but that depends on whether you have the volume of patients who are willing to use that uh, in your community. Another idea is asynchronous visits. So asynchronous visits are those where the patient, uh, you know, gives a, a video testimony of what's going on with them or even an audio depending on your um, software and it's stored at your convenience the physician would then access that uh, information make a diagnosis either call the patient or uh, you know if i have a virtual visit with that patient uh, at that time or record their own sort of assessment in a video setting or an audio setting and then the patient can uh, access that information on their own time as well. Asynchronous visits have been used um, largely in, in our situation with ALS patients uh, for about two or three years now, where a team of um, caregivers will go to the ALS patient's home, but the neurologist, who's a specialist in ALS, will sort of uh, review all those patients' care uh, when it's more convenient for the neurologist. 
as well. Dermatology is another field where uh, folks have uploaded pictures of their rash and it sort of sits in the virtual cloud for a little while until the physician has a chance to review it and then um, you know, respond to it uh, in an asynchronous way as well. So that might make scheduling a little easier um, for both patients and physicians. And then we have created a nice protocol for what happens when you conduct a virtual visit, but it's determined at some point for whatever reason during the virtual visit that the patient does need to actually come in. Um, they might need an EKG, a point of care lab, some blood work done, or you really need to just put that stethoscope on those lungs to make sure that it is just you know, asthma or um, something else. So make sure that that protocol is in place in your setting so that you're basically not billing the patient twice for the same issue. Um, and what we've done is basically we put in a zero charge for the uh, virtual visit if the patient comes um, in person for the same issue uh, within 24 hours. Next slide. Thank you for that, Dr. Shaw. So we have done similar things within our system. Our leadership has decided to actually do a more of a rotational schedule to keep our numbers as far as keeping almost like a telemedicine group of individuals and then actually having a thick clinic in different counties and then well clinics in different counties. So it's kind of an interesting rotation that our system has made, but it's because we do have so many physicians that we can rotate in and out of clinics. But what we have done to remain productive is actually really hustle with our staff. And we've had to put our staff in totally different roles by doing this. We have gotten our staff roles essentially if they're in the telemedicine groups that their main job is no longer vitaling patients giving shots or anything like that their main job is to look forward on the schedule and to see when the follow-up visits would have been when the medicare wellness visits would have been when these different things would have been on their physician schedule and they're converting patients to telehealth ahead of time so we have med refills, lab reviews, everything being converted because at this point they're being billed at parity for almost all of our insurances. So at this point, I've honestly not seen much of a drop at all as far as the numbers of patients I'm seeing. And I'm seeing almost all of my patients via telemedicine as, as far as well patients. Um, you can actually run reports if you have that capability in your EMR, and you can see who might be due for a Medicare wellness visit. You can schedule them when you notice that you're having drops on appointment times because Medicare has allowed patients to be seen for wellness visits. They can be seen safely over telemedicine. You can go ahead and tee them up for whatever labs they need to have done. You can get them scheduled for your office when the COVID crisis lifts and say, you know, you're going to need these labs in the near future. You're going to need this pneumococcal vaccine in the near future. You can have all of these visits scheduled for the near future. You can go ahead and order their DEXA, their mammogram, everything. And they can have that done from the comfort of their own home. And you can be getting paid at parity to do that as well. Um, we're having our staff screen the six visits. And if they're appropriate for a telehealth visit, we see them via telemedicine. If not, we do have, like I was saying, the sick clinics set up or the urgent care clinics, or if they're extremely ill, certainly we could have them go to the ER. Um, the, our office certainly is not currently seeing COVID patients just because of the choices of our leadership. We have um, actually clinics that are designated as COVID clinics. Next slide. So as far as scheduling remote and in-person visits, there was a, I would have had a pre-COVID telemedicine and this is how we were doing it previously. I personally liked having my telemedicine visits at the beginning of the day, the end of the day, 
or like right around lunchtime. And the reason I did that was because telemedicine visits paid less. It avoided me running into my better paying patients. And I didn't feel like I was being just ran off of my schedule. You would be seeing a patient, seeing a patient, seeing a patient, and then, oh, I have to go log in and go see this random patient on a telemedicine visit. It just made it nice because you knew my first patient of the day or my last patient of the day would be a telemedicine visit. My staff knew that they could do a work in if I had an opening for a quick acute visit for telemedicine, and that seemed to work pretty well. However, now there's the COVID telemedicine, and at this point, I would say almost anything goes. I have seen clinics doing morning blocks where it's all telemedicine and then bringing patients in that need to be seen afternoon face-to-face. -face. I've seen people putting people literally in the order they call in. So they're doing telemedicine and then they're doing face-to-face -face and just stacking it. I've seen telemedicine only practices and that was sort of what I was talking about previously to where some practices are doing telemedicine only, some are doing a mix of both. At this point with it paying at parity, it's more of a what works for you and your team. Long-term, when the numbers pick back up, I think we're gonna be doing more face-to-face -face again, obviously. We're gonna to want to dedicate telemed time on your schedule. It really does not work well to have going the going back and forth. You really wanna have more of a block time that is dedicated to telemedicine time, or at least that's my opinion. Next slide. So the next two questions, thank you so much um, to both of you. Um, will increased use of telemedicine lead to excessive use of antibiotics or prescribing of antibiotics? And then another question is, how do I responsibly practice controlled substance prescribing um, during the pandemic? So Dr. Roberts is gonna tackle this one. All right, so this is definitely a recognized risk in telemedicine, but I do believe as family physicians, we're already antibiotic stewards. And the more family physicians that we can get practicing telemedicine, the better antibiotic stewardship in telemedicine we can actually get. There's a November 2018 study that was done in JAMA. Um, the Cleveland Clinic reported that 66.1% of more than 8,000 telemedicine visits by adults for just respiratory viral infections, people got antibiotics. Why did they get it? Because when you get an antibiotic, you get that five-star rating. Patients paid money, patients didn't know the doctor, they got on the telemedicine, they expect something, they walk away with a Z-pack, everybody's happy. That's not good medicine, we know that. There's also a pediatrics article from April 2019 comparing children who had viral URI symptoms. People or the kids that saw the primary care physician, and that's including family docs as well as pediatricians, 31% got an antibiotic. Um, urgent care, more got antibiotics, 42%. Telemed, 52%. The key to this study, though, is when they said telemedicine visits, this was not a telemedicine visit with their primary care physician. This was a telemedicine doc in the box. They've never met this physician. I truly think as we're rolling out telemedicine to primary care physicians, family physicians, pa physicians who know their patients, antibiotic stewardship is going to get better. These patients actually trust us. They know us. If we say, look, John, look whoever, you've just got a virus. It's going to get better. If you don't get better, just call me. Call so-and-so at my office, let me know. We'll see you again next week, it'll be fine. And if we need to do the antibiotic, we'll do it. They trust that they can actually get you on that phone and that you will take care of them. They're not gonna push you as hard as they will, the doc in the box demanding the antibiotic. So I think the stewardship as a family doc, especially a primary care family doc who knows your patient over telemedicine is going to be much better than the stewardship of, if you would, I'm putting air quotes, traditional telemed, that is just acute care, one-off visits with a patient you'll never see again. Next slide. So 
So the next question is, how do I responsibly prescribe controlled substances during this pandemic? And this goes again almost to my antibiotic stewardship slide. Um, I put a lot of legal jargonese from the USDEA here. Two months ago, I would have said, you're not allowed to prescribe any narcotics or anything else over telemedicine, except for a handful of caveats, but essentially just don't do it unless you're doing hospice or sending something to a hospital. I mean, there's a handful of reasons that you can. And then COVID hit and all of the rules got lifted. So now you do need to meet a couple of conditions, but essentially they're the same conditions that you would meet with your known patient in your office. You need to have a prescription for a legitimate medical purpose. It needs to be a prescription that you would write in the usual course of your professional practice. The telemedicine communication should be real time, audio visual. You can see the patient, you can talk to the patient. You should obviously document in your chart the way you would document a normal visit. You should be acting in accordance to both your federal and your state laws. And you should check your PDMP just like you normally do and then write in your chart that you have checked your PDMP. As long as this public health emergency remains in effect, this is essentially the laws that they have given us for now. Do I think we can responsibly prescribe over telemedicine? I think we have been doing this for years. If it's a patient that we know well, and they call us for a refill of their Xanax because they are freaking out about the coronavirus. And we look in the chart and we're like, oh, we just saw June two weeks ago. We checked the PDMP and she's never asked for anything early. We would probably give her a small prescription for Xanax. And that's just over the phone. And that's as a primary care doctor. I think having the telemedicine allowing us to actually see her and speak to her and make sure everything is going okay might even give us better responsible prescribing than just giving it over the phone. As long as you're staying in the course of all of these different laws and all of your normal business practice. Next slide. So two more questions that Dr. Roberts is going to help us answer is, can physicians maintain their therapeutic presence while caring for patients remotely? And then should some discussions still occur in person, like our end of life discussions or um, mood related disorder discussions? Next slide. These are very good questions. And I think these are questions that we've been dealing with for a long time. How do you maintain a therapeutic presence? How do you stay the doctor while you're looking across some little tiny screen? And I actually got this off of one of the most recent um, AAFP articles. And she's doing a great job, I think, of maintaining a therapeutic presence. And she's doing telemedicine. She's got a nice professional look to her. She's wearing her scrubs. I'm not saying that we all need to wear our scrubs, but we should certainly appear well-groomed. We should have tested our video and sound quality ahead of time. Dr. Jenkins mentioned earlier that you should have lighting in front of your face. Don't be backlit. You don't want to look like some very dark shadow talking to the patient. You um, want to have a nice quiet area that you're talking to the person. You don't want to have I mean, I do have kids and dogs, but I do try to make sure that I don't have my kids screaming and my dogs barking in the background. That does not sound very professional. You want to have an office-like feel. You want the conversation to be private. You certainly don't want your family members or random people running back and forth in front of the video and making the patient think, oh my goodness, everything I'm saying is being said in front of this person's family. There's no privacy to that. You remember, you are still having a HIPAA compliant conversation. It does not matter where you're having it. It doesn't matter if you're doing telemedicine at your office or your house, you have to respect the patient's privacy. Next paragraph. I mean, I'm sorry, next slide. 
And should we ha be having some discussions in the office and in person? I think ideally any hard topic would be better face to face, but sometimes we're just not given that option. And if I had the option between over the phone or telemedicine, I think I would definitely rather have it over the video. And the reason I say that is at least I can see the patient's affect, I can see their grooming, I can see their surroundings, and they can see me. They can see that I'm nodding, that I'm looking concerned, that, I mean, we can have that human interaction together. And over the phone, we might be missing the cues that, I mean, their grooming has just gone downhill. They're holding a gun while they're talking about how in grief and depressed they are. I mean, they could be suicidal and you just don't realize it. There are a lot of things you can see during telemedicine you can see inside of their home that you would be surprised is going on in their home. So I think there is definitely benefit to it. Would it rank as high as a face-to-face -face visit? Certainly not, but I would definitely take it over nothing. Um, it's Telemedicine has been used successfully for many, many years by behavioral health specialists across the country. It's well used in mental health. And I think it can be successfully vetted. Next slide. So our final question um, for the webinar is for our, for our two panelists, what do you predict for the future of telemedicine after the pandemic is over? Next slide. So, when you talk about the future, I think we all get very excited. Those of us who have done uh, and invested our time and effort into learning about technology, telehealth, and even artificial intelligence, uh, there's lots of good stuff in the future. Technology has always been created to at least mostly um, help uh, processes become more efficient, uh, more accurate, and, and easier. Um, for uh, in a variety of ways. So hopefully uh, COVID-19 has just launched the telehealth wave and uh, increased utilization, not just for family medicine services, but also things like uh, pharmacy counseling um, or uh, of course, psychotherapy, dermatology, even physical therapy at home. Um, all kinds of ideas can be used um, for telemedicine. Social distancing will probably last longer than we're thinking at this moment, and I don't suspect that telemedicine is going to go away anytime soon. Um, you know, unless there's, of course, some uh, miracle uh, treatment for this or a vaccine that's very effective. Uh, so until there's social distancing, I think telehealth is here to stay, uh, one way or the other. And the the benefit that a lot of us have is seeing our patients just feel such incredible gratitude that we save them a potential hazardous visit um, or you know going out on a bus or a com or out in the community to come to the the clinic setting um, and it, you know I think one of our doctors had an 82 year old patient it took a long time to get her through that visit but afterwards she was so joyful and I think um, that that brings us um, some joy as well that we are teaching folks uh, how to use technology and get comfortable with it especially when it comes to healthcare my guess is that uh, you know patients uh, FAFP others will demand telehealth and uh, I think we have to stay steadfast on parity. Uh, we cannot compromise on that um, I know the temptation will be there there's lots of national um, you know, large corporations that offer telehealth as partnerships with their insurance companies um, and patients are being steered towards those vendors who are external. But I think we keep, we need to have research and data that shows that, you know, it is the continuity of care with the PCP that lasts, um, that, that really is uh, what contributes to long-term good health and uh, telehealth uh, parity is, is part of that. Um, and, you know, if you think about the cost of uh, the healthcare, what you're giving up when the patient comes in for um, the overhead, you know, perhaps electricity or the use of your staff uh, or certain equipment in your clinic, you're 
sort of replacing that with the cost of technology, you know, uh, paying for HIPAA protection, firewall, virus prevention on your computer systems, upgraded software, uh, support network. You know, if the, there's in our institution by far of all the administrative costs we have, IT is the largest. And, th you know, there needs to be some acknowledgement from payers about the importance of that as well. If there is no parity of payment, um, that would be uh, something that you know we have to expect. And if so, we are going to have to look at what is the national average that 30% uh, less payments are collected when they're in states when there is no parity um, law available for telehealth. Next slide. Thank you for that. Um, as far as my predictions for the future of telemedicine, I think essentially the genie has come out of the bottle because of the COVID-19 crisis. I mean, at this point, we've got both patients and we have providers that are going to be trained for the service and the patients are gonna have a new expectation to receive it. I have really been joyfully surprised at how well our patients have received it. Just today, I saw so many of my patients, and I would say over 60% of them were over the age of 50. Some were 70, 80 years old, and they were so happy to be using this technology. And if you would have asked me a few months ago how hard it would have been to recruit these same in individuals to use this technology, I would have guessed they would have been the hardest to recruit but they were happy to be home. They were happy to not have to go out and about. They were happy to be seeing their doctor. And they were just, I mean, giggly and joking around about, oh, I get, I mean, they just really like it. And when I asked them to, let's make us, you know, let's have a face-to-face -face in about three months with the hope that we will have all of these COVID restrictions lifted, Half of them actually told me, oh, well, we'll think about it. We might want to do this telemedicine. So they have accepted it beyond anything I would have even thought at the point they're saying they would rather do telemedicine than come into my office. I'm truly hopeful that payers will continue paying for it. It's really hard to roll back once you start paying. And when they do try to roll back, I think the patients are gonna throw a fit. The patients now expect it. And if the payers start rolling back and the physicians refuse to see the patients in this method, I don't think the patients are gonna be happy at all. One thing that I do think will go backwards are the guardrails. Um, right now, Medicare has essentially said it's a free for all. You can see patients with essentially any platform you want to. If you wanna FaceTime somebody, you can FaceTime them. I don't think that's appropriate long-term. Privacy concerns are real. We need to make sure that if we have the ability to see a patient with a HIPAA compliant platform that we do, and once this crisis is over, I don't think that we will be using HIPAA, non-HIPAA compliant platforms anymore because not using a reliable platform is just open, opening ourselves up for too much litigation. Not to mention, it's opening the patient's privacy up to being stolen. Next slide. Thank you so much, Dr. Shaw, Dr. Roberts. Um, we had kind of set aside a few minutes at the end of the webinar for those of you still hanging in there with us to answer questions um, proposed to us during the webinar from attendees. There's really only a few questions. So if um, Dr. Shaw, Dr. Roberts, if you wanted to address any of the questions that were posed. I have um, answered uh, to the organizer in the chat box 
some of the answers, um, but um, I want to just address the last one that just came about about legal liability and medical malpractice. And I'm sure uh, my other two esteemed panelists are also going to be pretty well versed in this. I think informed consent and verbal consent is key. Make sure it's documented that the patients have agreed and signed a form, if possible. Um, to provide to be you know uh, provided care through this modality, and also in this time we have developed a verbal consent, uh, which includes information and uh, uh, permission uh, to uh, ask the patient, hey, um, you do realize that you will get a share of this bill. Um, you know most insurance plans when the patient has a copay for an in-person visit, they're going to have a copay with this telehealth visit as well. So uh, th we don't want any surprises uh, when they receive their share of their co-insurance deductible or, um, or bill. And I, I really appreciate the idea about the chaperone, especially during sensitive exams. Um, I hadn't thought of that, um, but I think that that also helps prevent liability as well. Um, forming, uh, you know, one of our requirements is to um, provide an interpreter, including sign language, to our patients who need that. So partnering with an interpretive service, uh, an online one, uh, there are several uh, reputable ones that uh, that offer both video and audio services, and make sure you use that technology and have that uh, offered to your patients is also important to prevent potential legal um, barriers. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Shaw. And um, this question was touched on already, um, but I'll, I'll mention it again, is that one of the questions was most insurance companies push their members to demand telemedicine visits from their doctor because it's cheaper. And the question is, how does this affect the quality of care? I, I think Dr. Roberts did an excellent job kind of explaining the difference between contracted telemedicine visits with providers that are not familiar with patients versus um, family physicians performing telemedicine who can best determine uh, the appropriateness of telemedicine and the appropriateness of, of what can be managed and not managed remotely. And so I, I don't think the insurance companies could push family medicine physicians around very easily in making us do things that we didn't think was in the best interest of our patients. So hopefully as, as the Florida family, um, the FAFP helps champion telemedicine for family docs, um, we'll all be leaders in this. And, and we're not gonna let the payers tell us how to do this. We're gonna tell the payers how, what we think is appropriate. So we really have to have a strong voice. Excellent. Well, that seems to wrap up another successful FAFP COVID-19 webinar. I'm Dr. Chris Scuderi, the FAFP COVID-19 Task Force Chairman. I'd like to once again offer my sincere appreciation to Dr. Jenkins, Dr. Roberts, and Dr. Shaw for your expertise and excellent insights into a topic that has become extremely important as we've evolved through this crisis. I think it is fair to say that the practice of medicine is rapidly evolving to embrace virtual patient encounters, and the FAFP is committed to helping support our members through the telemedicine transition. Join us next week on Thursday, April 30th from 8 to 9 p.m. for a very special guest, Mr. Sean Martin, American Academy of Family Physicians Vice President of Advocacy, Practice Advancement, and Policy. He will become the new Executive Vice President of the AFP in August 2020, replacing Dr. Doug Henley, who is completing an outstanding and story career the EVP position for the last 20 years. Sean will be discussing national advocacy for family physicians during the COVID-19 crisis, whereby he will discuss the most current developments on stimulus payments for physicians, prospective payment options for primary care, and his ideas for how family medicine will not only survive COVID-19, but thrive into the future. If you have any further questions about tonight, you may submit them via chat, and we can answer them over the next 24 hours. Lastly, remember all the FAFP webinars can be located by going to the FAFP website by logging into www.fafp.org. Be well, stay healthy, and have a great night. And thank you for being joining us tonight. <laughs>